someone on the top of the pyramid to speak into this speaking tube and eventually you would be able to presumably communicate directly with uh, Pakal in his tomb. This 20-ton sarcophagus was built to last an eternity. This actually had a lid which was rolled off to one side and there was a cavity for his body to be put so that when he eventually did die, the door was sealed and the stairway was blocked. His architects and sculptors designed a coffin rich in symbolism portraying the resurrection of Pakal in the afterworld. Royal scribes were ordered to draw a grid to accommodate 640 glyphs that would tell the story of Pakal's reign. Many Maya pyramids don't leave much textual record on them. The opposite is the case in the temple, the inscriptions. Everything about it, from these huge tablets on the summit to the information inside, proclaims that this is the final resting place of the founder of one of the great Maya dynasties. In 683, during Pakal's 68th year as king, the 12-year-old boy who grew to be one of the great Maya rulers died at the age of 80. He was covered in red cinnabar and adorned in lavish jewelry. A jade mask was placed over his face Though the legacy of Pakal the Great would be hard to match, his son had been waiting on the sidelines for nearly 50 years. With the clock ticking, he would launch a series of building projects harnessing the laws of physics and Mother Nature. In 1985, Pakal's burial mask was stolen from a museum in Mexico. Fortunately, four years later, the mask was recovered. 684 AD, the mighty King Pakal has engineered Palenque to be one of the finest Maya capitals ever known. After 68 years on the throne, his body is buried in a tomb that rivals those built for the Egyptian pharaohs. Now it is up to his son to build upon his father's legacy and cement his own reign. His name was Khan Balam. Pakal was the founder of a dynasty, but his son was a great consolidator. He was someone that was going to make sure that that dynasty would continue. The 48-year-old king immediately threw himself into an ambitious three-pyramid complex that would stand as his own monument for the ages. He designed and constructed uh, the cross group, uh, one of the most intricate and beautiful groups of ceremonial temples ever constructed in the Maya world. These are his memorial, and they tower above the palace. They look down on the works of his father. And in some ways, I think they represent a statement of individuality that he himself is going to leave his imprint on the city, just as his father did. He ordered his engineers to build three intricate structures, the Temple of the Cross, the Temple of the Foliated Cross, and the Temple of the Sun. Khan Balam's engineers would take a giant leap forward using sophisticated geometric calculations unsurpassed anywhere in the world based on the Maya's creation of a complete number system. One of the many ways in which the Maya were ahead of their time was in their creation of what we would refer to as zero. With a similar combination of a, of a shell the, which represented zero or completion, and then a dot, number one, and then a five, by just you know, placing them in different positions, they were able to multiply you know, uh, and reach incredible numbers. The uh, Greeks and Romans were tremendous engineers, uh, theologians, historians, and so forth, but were very limited by their mathematical system because they didn't have a zero. So here you have the irony that they were able to gr produce great public works, philosophy, and whatnot, but were really pretty lousy mathematicians compared to the Maya. Khan Balam's engineers advanced mathematical observations may have included the discovery of proportions like the square roots of rectangles and something called the golden mean, a naturally occurring proportion that can be seen in animals, nature, and even the human body as 1 to 1.618. 
measure a person from his head to his belly button and then from his belly button to his feet, you get a proportion very close to 1 to 1.618, the golden mean. Some scholars believe this proportion has been appearing in structures for thousands of years at places like the Pyramids of Giza in Egypt and the Parthenon in Greece. Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is a study of this proportion, and some even say he painted the Mona Lisa using this ratio in her features. With nothing more than some sticks and a cord, Khan Balam's engineers may have been able to measure the square roots of rectangles. In the Temple of the Cross, these shapes would be used to mark the two main piers of the facade, the width of the medial doorway and the interior walls. The golden ratio can be seen in the rear chambers and the base of the structure with the side wall as one and the back wall as 1.618. By using repeated squares and natural proportions in the Temple of the Cross, a beautifully calculated floor plan took shape, full of geometry, mythological history, and a king's own legacy. But not all engineering in Palenque was done with an eye on the afterlife. Palenque's engineers also had to focus on more practical needs. One of the names of Palenque is La Camja, which means place of great waters. Um, we have four rivers running through Palenque year round. We have dozens of springs. We have water everywhere. These riches came with challenges. Palenque was surrounded by steep hills, natural springs and creeks that carved their way through the base of the site leaving only bits and pieces of flat, water-free land for building. Unlike most Maya cities, the problem facing Palenque wasn't how to store water for the dry season, it was how to deal with an overabundance of water. As you can see, everything is green here, it rains every day. So to meet this challenge, the city planners devised a unique way of diverting the pre-existing streams by building subterranean aqueducts that would channel the water underground, thus saving more land on top for cultivation. These tunnels were lined with limestone and they were covered with our old friend from Egypt and Greece, the Corbel Vault. A series of protruding stones, one on top of the other, formed sort of an arch overhead. Now these ceilings were so sturdy, they could support the massive weight of Palenque's giant plazas overhead. So the people were walking along with the water rushing underneath them, being diverted away from the city, just like it is where I live today in New York City. What's even more impressive is that there are signs that Maya engineers may have figured out a way to create water pressure. They built water tunnels that ran through the rugged terrain into the city, often directed uphill. As they got closer to the main structures, the pipes got incrementally smaller. Like Roman fountains, the water pressure gained momentum as it coursed through increasingly narrower tunnels, eventually allowing for running water throughout Palenque's buildings. We have beautiful systems of, of sweat baths and swimming pools and aqueduct. In its day, it would have rivaled any of the Roman aqueduct systems. We don't see this use of, of water pressure anywhere else, and it doesn't appear again until the Spanish bring the technologies with them. Together, Khan Balam and his father Pakal ruled Palenque for nearly 100 years, pushing Maya engineering to a level never seen before. The future seemed bright for this city on the rise, but its years of glory are about to come to a sudden end. Something is happening in the Maya world that will cause the classic city-states to implode. The Maya had developed the concept of zero by the 4th century AD, but the Europeans wouldn't understand the concept until 800 years later. By the 8th century, Palenque, Tikal, and the other kingdoms of the Maya world were expanding across the continent. Tall pyramids, unparalleled city planning, and sumptuous royal palaces advertised the glory of the great kings. Then, suddenly, these cities began to unravel, one after another. <laughs> 